What I'm going to try to do today is give you a picture of what's been happening over the last few weeks and months with health care reform. Uh, I've been pretty busy reading regulations uh, for the past probably month. Uh, February 10th, they came out with 300 pages of regulations in regard to the employer mandate. A few days later, they came out with um, new regulations about the 90-day waiting period. And then, um, beginning of this month, they came out with regulations on the reporting requirements that you, as a large employer, will have to do in 2015, 2016. Uh, now, the problem is that every time the federal government, the IRS, the DOL, HHS, they release regulations. They went from proposed regulations to final regulations. The issue and problem for all of us is they make changes to them. And it drives all of us nuts because, in fact, we've, uh, we've communicated one thing to you, and then all of a sudden we're going to uh, communicate other things to you. Now, I have a formal presentation, but let me give you some just highlights of what those indications are, and I'll go through them in more detail. Now, throughout the presentation, if you have any questions, just raise your hand, speak up. I'm very informal, uh, and, um, and if you don't feel comfortable with that, I'll stay over after uh, the break, just so you have any questions. But a couple things are real important. First of all, uh, what the new regulations did, they created a special rule uh, and they said if you are a company between 50 to 99, if you jump through some hoops, uh, you don't have to comply with the employer mandate until 2016, January 2016. So what the, what the uh, Internal Revenue Service did, they changed the definition of large employer. So if you have between, uh, and I'll be going through this, between 50 to 99 employees, you have another year to get ready for this and it's January of 2016. Second of all, if you have 50, if you have 100 or more employees, uh, if you meet a special transitional rule, you don't have to comply as of January 2015. You can wait till your renewal date in 2015. So again, those are extremely special rules and I'll be going through those in a few minutes. Uh, next, in regard to the 90-day waiting period. Uh, remember, the 90-day waiting period for medical benefits kicks in in 2014. Uh, in February of 2014, they came out with regulations that said, okay, a 90-day waiting period, no problem, but as an employer, what you can do before you institute the 90-day waiting period, you as an employer could institute a 30-day orientation period. So instead of being 90 days now, now it's 120 days. Uh, this was, there was no indication this in the proposed regs. Uh, this is in the final regs. So as an employer, what you could do if you wanted to, starting in 2014, you can tell your employees, all right, we're going to impose an, a 30-day orientation period, and then we're going to start the 90-day waiting period. So in essence, what happens is that the employees, any full-time employee, is going to be eligible on the 121st day as opposed to the 91st day. That's extremely important. All right? So let's go through, and um, I'm going to comment on each of these slides. So beginning in 2015, certain large employers may be subject to penalty taxes for failing to offer health care coverage to all full-time employees or offering minimum essential coverage that's unaffordable or if the benefits are less than 60%. So for those of you, um, please remember the definition of a large employer, if you qualify, is any employer with 100 or more employees starting in 2015. All right. So the penalty tax is due if any full-time employee is certified to the employer as having purchased health coverage through the exchange and getting a credit and subsidy. What's important here to understand is the most important thing as an employer you have to determine is which of your employees are full-time. And the definition of a full-time employee is anyone who works 30 hours or more. So you have no obligation in the future to um, provide any coverage to any part-time employee. So there's no obligation. 
Now, the employer mandate uh, is officially effective as of January 1, 2015, but the IRS has provided uh, three transitional rules. And just like everything else that the IRS does, it's hard to understand. Let me try to break it down for you. If you are a large employer with 100 or more employees, first of all, what you have to do is you have to uh, make sure that an employer will not face penalties for full-time employees who are eligible for coverage as of February 9th, 2014, as long as the employer offers them affordable coverage, minimum coverage, all right, as of the first plan year beginning in 2015. Now, in order to do this, uh, in the previous open enrollment before February 9th, 2014, you either had to do one of two things. Uh, at your open enrollment before February 9th, 2014, you either had to offer coverage to one-third of your employees or covered at least one-quarter of your employees. Now, you can use either all employees or just full-time employees, and for this definition, a full-time employee is anyone working 30 hours or more. So basically, uh, in summary, what I'm trying to say is if you are a large employer, over 100, 100 or more, excuse me, uh, starting into your first renew uh, renewal in 2015, you have to offer coverage to all full-time employees, but before that, uh, in order to use this, did you, one, offer coverage at least uh, to one-third of your employees or covered at least one-quarter of your employees at any open enrollment before February 9th, 2014? If you don't meet these requirements and you're over 100 or more, then what you have to do is comply with the employer mandate as of January 2015. If you meet these requirements and you're a large employer, 100 or more, then you can re uh, wait until your renewal in 2015. So if your renewal, for example, is in July and August, you don't have to do anything until July of August of 2015. All right? And I know this is gobbledygook. So the last two safe harbors will be available uh, for employees who are offered coverage and in start, in starting in 2015, it, it must be minimum coverage that's affordable, all right? And again, in all cases, employers could determine the percentage of covered employees as of the end of the most recent open enrollment before February 9th, 2014. Why February 9th? Because the regulations were released on February 10th. That's why some strange dates come along. Uh, but again, uh, they give you relief, so it's extremely important to look at these uh, and again, I have a 22 or 23 page explanation of this uh, that you can receive and I go into detail about this. So if you're getting totally confused. Now, who is the employer? To determine, who, to determine whether you are a large employer, what you first have to do is during 2014 to, to decide whether you're a large employer and what this slide is trying to say, you do it according to what's called control group rules. Uh, under code section 414 B, C, and M, and O, uh, in layman's language, what does that mean? Um, does your employer have a controlling interest in other businesses? A controlling interest means do the same five or fewer individuals own at least 80% of each entity? And if that's the case, then those are all grouped together and we treat them as one employer. And as one employer, if you have 100 or more, then starting in 2015, you have to be worried about the employer mandate. So all employers of all uh, of employers within the control group are taken in consideration in deciding whether you are a large employer. All right? Now, these are the same rules that apply to your 401k plan. And for other benefit purposes, this is not something new. Your accountant or your attorney should tell you whether your employer owns other businesses and whether they have a controlling interest. So this is not something new. So an employer is large if it's employed on average at least 100 full-time employees on business days during the preceding calendar year. 
Now, in determining whether you're a large employer, what you have to do is consider all hours that individuals work. So uh, if somebody works 30 hours or more, that's considered one full-time employee. But in determining whether you're a large employer, all part-time hours have to be considered. And what we do for any month, we total up the number of full-time, uh, part-time hours, and we divide by 120. And that creates an individual called a full-time equivalent employee, and that's added to the figures. But again, for this purpose, a full-time employee for any month is anyone who is employed at least 30 hours a week for this purpose. Now, there is a bill in Congress to raise this. Um, so far, I don't think it's gotten, it's, it right now is in the House. I don't know whether it's going to, even if it passes the House, whether it's going to, again, be voted on in the Senate. So we don't know at this point. Now, in 2015, the final regulation provided an important new transitional role for employers with less than 100 employees. If the following conditions are met, no penalty tax will apply until 2016 for employers with 50 to, to 99. Because the statute says a large employer is 50 or more. With the IRS, did, they created a special fiction for 2015 that says, if you are 50 to 99, we're going to give you another year to comply. But you, again, just like anything else, you have to jump through some hoops. And first of all, limited workforce size, you, ha you have to be, during 2014, at least between 50 to 99. All right. So first of all, you have to look and see how many employees you have to see if you're between 15 to 99. Then you have to maintain your workforce and aggregate hours, which means you can't fire people because you want to get down to that figure. You can get rid of people, but you have to document a valid business purpose for getting rid of people. And I know many employers during 2014 told people, you're getting fired because of health care reform. That was not a good conversation. All right. So again, uh, they'll look at it and see exactly uh, why did you get rid of people? And if it's for a valid business purpose, no problem. So if you're hovering around 101, 102 and said, God, if I just got rid of three more people, I have another year. Uh, you have to find a valid business purpose for getting rid of them. Next, uh, you have to maintain previously offered health coverage. You can't get rid of it. Whatever you offered before, you have to continue to offer it. And you, ha you can't get rid of your coverage. And lastly, uh, basically for 2015, you have to, again, the IRS will come up with a certification, and you have to swear that the facts presented is true under penalties of perjury. So they're going to create a certification you have to send in with your tax return indicating that you comply with these uh, safe, new safe harbors. So if you're between 50 to 99, you have another year to comply with uh, health care reform. But again, you have to understand the hoops you have to jump through. All right? Any questions so far? So an employer must take into account part-time employees to determine whether you're a large employer. The number of full-time equivalent employees that the employer employed during the preceding year are taken into consideration. And when you're determining whether you're a large employer, you count everyone. All right? That's an extremely important. Now, remember, just because you count them doesn't mean you have to offer them coverage. This is the only place in healthcare reform that part-timers are considered and this is the trumped up uh, the numbers. Uh, because if somebody, if you're an employer that has a lot of part-timers, uh, what they want you to do would be, is to be responsible. And that's why part-time hours are considered to determine whether you're a large employer. Now, in the approach for converting part-time employees to full-time employees, and let's go over this, for each month you calculate the aggregate number of hours in each month. Uh, do not include anyone that works 120 hours or more. So if somebody works in a month 120 hour, uh, at least 120 hours, that's considered to be one full-time employee. If you work less than 120 hours, you're considered part-timers, 
and then all the part-time hours are totaled up and then divided, and then you divide that total figure by 120, and you do that for each month. That will determine your full-time equivalent employees, and those are added to your full-time employees. So you look at each business day someone works, um, and the employer, uh, the IRS has provided a multi-step method for calculating, and I will cover that in the next few seconds. Now, in order to determine whether you're a large employer, what you have to do is go through this calculation. And the statute says you do it over a calendar year 2014. First of all, you calculate the number of full-time employees, including seasonal, for each month. Ne next, you calculate the number of full-time equivalent employees. You add the two together. You add the number of full-time employees and full-time equivalents in step one and two for each month. And then you divide that figure by 12. And if that figure for 2015 is 100 or more, then you have to comply with the employer mandate. So that's what you must do. For, so that's the calculation. Now, what they've created is a special transitional role. Even though the statute says that you have to use the calendar year, uh, for 2014, you can use any consecutive six-month period. And this could be a boom for any of you who have seasonal businesses. I was talking to a racetrack owner who is dark uh, two or three months out of the year. A no-brainer, which basically what you do is those months you do dark, uh, that you're dark, you consider that in your six-month period, and this calculation could give you another year. So even though the statute says you use 12 months, they've created a special fiction for 2015 and says you can use any six consecutive months for 2014 to determine whether you're a large employer. And again, for some of you, this could be a godsend, especially if you run a seasonal business. Now, uh, there's also a special rule, uh, and this is in the statute. What this slide is trying to say, if you run a business, and if you employ seasonal employees for 120 days or less, for the large employer calculation, those seasonal employees are then ignored. So let's say you own a series of Dairy Queens. And during the season, you only employ 30 employees. But for, uh, for four months out of the year, you employ hundreds of people during the summer. And because of employing those seasonal employees for up to 120 days, uh, that could make you a large employer. And for this calculation, what they're saying is you can ignore those seasonal employees, but only if they work 120 days during the year. If they work more 120 days, I'm sorry, you can't ignore them. So if you, work, uh, if you have a business where uh, people work during Christmas or, or during any other holiday or during the summer, this could give you some relief. Now, again, uh, please remember there are two penalty taxes under health care reform. One is if you decide not to offer coverage. The other, is if you offer coverage and it's deemed to be unaffordable or not minimum coverage. One is a $2,000 penalty, which I will go through. The other is a $3,000 penalty. And some employers are seriously considering not offering coverage. Um, people are getting their renewals for 2014 now, and uh, they're going, oh my god, it's really expensive. And there are many. And, over the last six months, many employers are thinking about dropping coverage and paying the penalty. Uh, and again, depending on what your culture and the environment that you're in, that may be a consideration. Now, the most important thing if you're a large employer that you have to determine is if you, uh, which of your employees are full-time. For those of you who employ um, anyone who works 30 hours or more, that would be a simple calculation. No problem. But many of you have seasonal businesses 
or have seasonal employees or have people that are deemed to be variable hour employees. A variable hour employee is that some parts of the year they may work 20 hours, other parts of the year no hours, and some parts of the year 50 hours. That's called a, a variable hour employee. And what the uh, Internal Revenue Service has done is created some safe harbors to make a determination of whether that employee is actually full time. And you have to make that determination of whether they are full time in order or not to offer them coverage. So that's an important calculation. So a variable hour employee is anyone who's part time or seasonal whose hours will vary and you have to decide by 2015 whether they are full time to offer them coverage because if you don't you could be subject to a penalty. So this calculation is the most important calculation you will have to do in the next few months is make a determination of whether any of your employees are full time. Now who is considered an employee? Uh, and I have there a common law standard. What does that mean? And this is going to be an extremely important debate um, over the next few years. Um, a common law standard means do you control when they work, how they work? Um, and what the IRS is and the DOL are grumbling about is that some employers employ temporary employees. They're not really temporary employees. Yeah, uh, Jim over here has worked for five years, but he's temporary. Uh, be very careful uh, when you employ people. If you control when they work and how they work, the uh, DOL is, is going to consider that individual uh, to be your employee, whether they're temporary through an agency or independent contractors. This is going to be a big battle over the next few years, especially with health care reform. Yes? I, I can't hear you, I'm sorry. Then you should be, if you look at this, you should be fine. Okay. You should be fine. But many employers, to skirt the law, are playing fast and loose with the rules. They're not, they're not actually looking at the rules. And, the, and you, you, if you look online, and you look at um, IRS rules, um, independent contractor versus employee, there's a set of uh, probably eight to 10 different factors that you can use to determine whether an individual is uh, actually your employee. And again, because of these, all these different new rules and because of these new penalties, they, both the IRS and DOL are going to look at these very closely. And in, the, and in the final regulations under the employer mandate, they basically indicated what you have to look at. If you use temporary employees through an agency, those agency employees could be your employees if you control how they work and when they work. So it's a facts and circumstance determination. Now, one thing is very important, starting in 2015, for those of you that are large, you have to start counting hours. And what the, uh, and what the various governmental agencies have said is the fact you have to count all hours they get paid for, vacations, holidays. All hours are counted for determining whether an employee is a large employer. So you have to make a determination of how many hours they actually work. So you, you have to start counting hours. Uh, if you don't count hours, they have what's called a day's equivalent or a week's equivalent, where if somebody works a day for you, they're deemed to work eight hours. And if they work a week for you, they're, they're deemed to work 40 hours. Please don't use these equivalents. Um, they're very generous. OK? Now, the question is, well, so, so, and I've talked to businesses where they say, well, I pay somebody so much per day. How do I do that? We, what, basically, what you have to do and look and see how many hours in your estimation does that translate to? Uh, what do you do in this situation if you, for example, if you have a school and you pay somebody per season? Uh, many times, coaches are paid a, a set amount for the season. Uh, basically, uh, the IRS has not created any rules on this, and basically what your school district has to do is come up with a 
estimation of how many hours that translates to. So, and it has to be across the board because somebody teach, uh, somebody coaching the first year is going to spend five billion hours as opposed to somebody who's taught for 10 years or coached for 10 years and the hours would be different. So you have to come up with a reasonable estimation of how many hours that, that translates to. And it's also very important, you have to be very careful because does that somebody who is working for your district also perform other services for you? Are they a substitute teacher? Do they coach more than one season? All will go into trying to decide whether that person is actually full time. All right? So again, um, hours for service include paid leave, it includes vacation, holiday leaves for absence, layoffs, jury duty, military duty. Anything you pay an employee for will be considered to be service for this purpose to determine whether they're full time. Now, this is where it gets real interesting because uh, do any of you employ part-time or seasonal employees? Raise your hand. Anybody here? Okay. Now, uh, this is going to be very difficult, very convoluted, and remember, I didn't write this. I'm just the messenger. Uh, there's three safe harbors that the IRS has created. One is if you are going to determine on a monthly basis if somebody works 30 hours in a month then you have to offer them coverage um, at the beginning of the fourth month. What most employers are doing, they're using what's called a look back measurement period. Uh, and you basically use a look back measurement period from three to 12 months for ongoing and new employees. And this applies to any employee that's considered to be part-time or seasonal that you really can't determine whether they're going to work full time. So as a luxury, what you can do is create this measurement period, measure how many hours they work, and during that measurement period, for example, if you use 12 months, they would have to work 1,560 hours to be considered full time. Now it's 130 hours per month times 12, so if you use any lesser period, it's uh, 130 hours times the number of months you use. And talking to many employers, I, I am partial to the 12-month period because as an employer, you can manipul manipulate the hours. It gives you enough time to control who's part-time and who's full-time. Now, as I said before, the safe harbors are extremely complex but both rely on some defined time periods and generally must be measured in a uniform fashion for all employees. Under the monthly measurement period, employees are identified as full-time for initial eligibility using their hours on each calendar month. And if somebody works 30 hours, you have to offer them coverage then the beginning of the fourth month. And these employees must be offered coverage at the beginning of the month after three calendar months of employment. Now, during the look-back defined periods, uh, we have a look-back measurement period. And you as, you as an employer pick any three to 12 month period to measure whether these people are working full time. It's up to you. And then if they are full time, there's something you'll see the term stability period. So after meeting the minimum hours threshold during the look-back measurement period, Employees must be treated as full-time regardless of the actual hours work during the subsequent stability period. So let's say, for example, you had to comply with health care reform as of January 2015. Let's say that. That means you had to start counting hours um, as of October or November 2013 to October, November 2014 and therefore you have to offer them coverage and be ready to as of January 1st, 2015. So the stability period can't be shorter than duration, the number of months in the associated measurement period. If the employee meets the minimum threshold during the look back period, then the ensuing stability period must be at least six months. If an employee does not meet the minimum hours threshold, the stability period 
can't be longer than the measurement period. Now, in between the measurement and the stability period is something called an optional administrative period in between, and that's where you offer them coverage. It can be a period of at least 90 days, or it can be, it cannot exceed 90 days, excuse me. Now, it must be uniform, but you can vary the period between collective bargaining, non-collective bargaining. You can do it between collective bargaining employees. You can have different periods for salaried versus hourly, and employees and employed are located in different parts of the country. All right. Now, there's one safe harbor for ongoing employees. This is called a standard look back measurement and stability periods. And you as an employer pick that period. And it has to bump up against when you have to offer them coverage in 2015 or 2016. So again, it will be determined when you have to offer them coverage. And again, you can have an optional administrative period. Now here's an example. If you're saying to yourself, what in the hell is he talking about? Um, standard look back period. And let's assume I have a calendar year plan. I have to offer coverage as of 1-1-2015. The standard look back period is from 10-15-2013 to 10-14-2014. My administrative period is between 10-15-2014 to 12-31-2014. And then, and then the first time I have to offer coverage is from 1-1-2015 to 12-31-2015. And I only offer coverage to those part-time or seasonal employees who I've determined to be full-time. So I have to do this every year for ongoing employees. I have to make this, so if you are an employer that has a lot of part-time or seasonal employees, you have to go through this gyration every year. And some years, individuals are going to be full-time, and some years they're not. So you, uh, again, offer them coverage and you drop coverage. You offer them coverage and you drop coverage. And then when they're, not, when they're no longer eligible, then you have to offer them COBRA. Now remember, if somebody is working 28 hours a week, this doesn't apply to them. So if you have employees that are traditionally part-time and they never work more than 30 hours, don't worry about this. You're home free. Okay? Only for those employees that are seasonal and variable hour employees, well, depending on the time of the year or their position, they, some weeks they may work 20 hours, other weeks 50 hours, other weeks 40 hours, other weeks no hours. So you have to use a measurement period to see if they're full time. In order to be full time in this example right here, they would have to work 1,560 hours over a 12-month period. All right? Yes? Correct. If they work, uh, if they work at the end of the 12-month period, if they work 1,558 hours, Remember, close only counts in horseshoes and hand grenades. <laughs> Not here. I'm sorry. You have to work 1,560 hours. Now, to even make your day even better, there's also a uh, safe harbor for new employees. Now, how many of you have a lot of turnover? How many of you employ people all the time? Well, again, you need help with this because what's, what's going to happen, what these slides are trying to say, if you hire anyone and at the time that you hire them, you're not sure whether they're going to work part-time or full-time. It will vary. And in this situation, basically what you have to do is each new full-time employee gets their own measurement period. And it starts either on the date of hire or the beginning of the month after the date of hire. 
and each individual gets the, their own what's called initial measurement and stability periods. So again, not only do you have to have a standard measurement period, but again, each new employee gets their own initial look back measurement and stability periods. Now, if you hire anyone that you know is going to work full time, this doesn't apply to them. So if you know at the time of hire that person is going to work 30 hours a week, at least 30 hours a week, then the 90 day waiting period kicks in. Only for those individuals, this only applies to those individuals who are part time or seasonal where you can't make a reasonable determination whether they're going to work full time or not. Please remember that. And, and this slide kind of uh, enforces that. So again, the initial look back measurement and stability periods are unique for each variable hour employee. Um, you can actually use their start date at the beginning of the month after their start date. Uh, and this is something that what I would recommend is using the beginning of the month after their start date because if you have a lot of people that you hire, then you only have 12 start dates during the year as opposed to 365. So there's several, several limitations. And let's look at them. The initial look back measurement and, and administrative period combined cannot exceed 13 months plus a fraction of a month. So you can withhold coverage for any, any individual in this circumstance for, o, for over a year. That's why this determination is extremely important. And the employee's initial stability periods can't be shorter than the standard measurement uh, stability periods. So I, I'm going to skip a couple slides. I'll go back to them. And I have a couple examples. What's happening here? Oh. Uh, all right, here's a couple examples. This is slide 34. We have Jim that starts employment at 5-10-2014. This employer has decided to use 11-month initial measurement periods uh, followed by a single administrative period. So Jim's initial measurement period runs from 5-10-2014 to 4-9-2015. The administrative period runs from 4-10-2015 to 6-30-2015. And then the initial stability period runs from 7-1-2015 to 6-30-2016. Uh, this period is particular to Jim. And Jim is only offered coverage is at the end of the initial measurement period you decide uh, and you determine that they're, um, he's working full time. OK? So again, if you determine he's working full time, then you offer them coverage during the initial stability period. Now, um, at 6.30, 2016, if Jim is still working, and again, uh, one thing to remember is that you as an employer have to continue to offer them coverage during the initial stability period, even if Jim's hours go below full time. But let's say you look, so as of 6-30-2016, at the end of his initial stability period, we look back and see if Jim is full time during the employer's standard cycle. So each new employee gets their own initial cycle, initial measurement period, but after that they become an ongoing employee and you have to then determine during the employer's standard cycle whether they're full time. So uh, in this situation we measure Jim during the employer's standard cycle. We determine he's full time, so therefore he continues to get coverage from 7 1 2016 to 12 31 2016. And then after that, Jim now is measured during the standard the employer standard cycle. So as you can see here, 
it's going to take some effort to measure all this. Because you have to coordinate in this situation between the initial measurement period and the employer standard cycle. Now I have another example. This is Sam. Sam's hire date again is 5-10-2014, but in this situation the employer has decided to use a 12-month measurement period. And here the difference is the employer has decided to start the um, initial measurement period as of 6-1-2014, the beginning of the month after the hire date. All right, so again, Sam's initial measurement period runs from 6-1-2014 to 5-31-2015. We have a short administrative period at the beginning, a very short one at the end, but the standard, but the initial stability period starts at 7-1-2015, just like at the other example. And again, I just want to emphasize, every new employee gets their own initial standard stability period, which is the same length as the measurement period. And again, in this situation, at the end of Sam's initial stability period, we look back and see if Sam is full-time during, uh, during the employer standard cycle. And if he is, the employer continues to offer them coverage after 7-1-2016. Any questions? Yes? What if you hire an employee today as you don't know if they're full-time or part-time, you go through the measurement period, and they have worked more than 30 hours in that measurement period. You offer them health insurance, they accept. After a month or two, they decide, well, I'm going to semi-retire. I don't want to work 30. I want to work 20 hours a week. Can you drop their health coverage? No. During the standard, during their um, stability period, no matter how many hours they work, you have to continue to offer them coverage. And this is going to be a real challenge to some of you. Uh, some of you have a lot of turnover, some of you, um, because the issue and, and problem is going to be is, if that person, if you pay for coverage for a person during a month and he leaves during the month, and you've already paid the entire premium, how are, you, how are you going to get your money back if that person leaves? Because many times the insurance companies will want you to pay for the full month. And all of a sudden you can't get those monies back from the employee because they're gone. So what you have to do is arrange with the insurance company, as soon as that person leaves employment, that, that coverage ends. You have to check with the insurance company to see if they can do this. But again, for those of you who have a lot of turnover, this is going to be a mini nightmare to do all this because you have to, do, you have, to have really good record keeping to make sure you get this right. And because what's going to happen is that in 2015, you have to report to the government exactly who is full time who you offered coverage to because they're going to use that information, compare it to the information from the exchanges and penalize you if you don't get it right. Okay? Yes, ma'am. If we have them sign a waiver, if they waive insurance, isn't it true that they cannot go out to the exchange and purchase insurance if they waive it if we offer it? Correct. The only responsibility you have as an employer in the future, if you're a large employer, whether it's 2015 or 2016, is to offer them coverage. If they don't want it, you have them sign a waiver. And then you keep it in their file, and in case they go on the exchange, uh, and the IRS tries to penalize you, you say, wait a minute, we did offer the coverage. Here's the statement. They didn't want it. And even though the employee lied on the exchange, you have evidence you offer them coverage, which will happen. Okay? But again, this is extremely complicated, and you have to make sure you understand exactly what the rules are. Now, let's go back and let's go through some of the, rule, some of the rules. Let's go back to slide 31. So, once a new employee has completed the initial uh, look back period and stability period, 
the employee must be tested full-time status using the standard look-back period, which means every new employee gets one initial period and then they're, again, treated as an ongoing employee and you have to treat them like everybody else. Starting with the standard uh, look-back measuring period, the employee's full-time status is determined at the same time using the same conditions applied to other ongoing employees. As my example showed, everybody gets one initial bite at the apple with their own period and then they're thrown in with everybody else. So if an employee fails to meet the full-time status during the initial measurement period, then what happens is they're part-time and you don't offer them coverage. So during their stability period, you don't offer them coverage and every year what you must do, throw them in with the, all the other employees and measure and see if they're full-time and there could be some people that you never have to offer coverage to, but you have to document this because some of these individuals may in the future go to the exchange and you have to have documentation whether they're full-time or part-time. Are there any questions? Now remember, for a variable and seasonal employees, calculating the 90-day limit on the administrative period uses total days. Now, one thing is very important. Uh, in the new regulations that came out, the IRS defines a seasonal employee as anybody who works six months or less. So uh, if you have a business that employs seasonal employees and they work more than six months, you can't use these calculations and you must offer, if they work full time for you, you have to offer them coverage after 90 days. So if you, for example, if you have a lawn service and somebody works for you eight months, these calculations don't apply to you. And if they work full time for you, um, after that 90 day waiting period, you have to again offer them coverage. But the interesting fact on this is when they come back again, you institute another 90 day period. And then another 90 day period, year after year, but again, these calculations, if you have any seasonal employees that, that work more than six months, this calculation doesn't apply to you. Now, um, in regard to this, there are some special rules. There are special rules for educational employers. Uh, these include for-profit, not-for-profit. Um, and what they basically indicate is that for periods of time that you have a, they're off for more than four weeks. You as an educational employer have a choice. You can either, in calculating whether they're a, a full-time employee, ignore that period or count hours during that period, but there's a limit how many hours you use. There's a 501 hour limit for any periods of absence with zero hours of service. So again, in this situation with educational employees, as this slide 38 indicates, these new rules, the ed educational employer may either determine the employee's average hours per week during the measurement period after excluding the employment break and using the average for the entire measurement period or credit employees with hours during a break, but you can only credit up to 501 hours. And these rules only apply uh, to educational employers. Now also for unpaid absences, if anybody goes on, um, um, goes and comes back and they're a part-time or seasonal employee, uh, for absences of 13 or more weeks for a period with no hours of service for 13 consecutive weeks, when that person is rehired, they're treated as a new employee, but for this purpose, an educational employer has to use the period of 26 weeks. So if somebody um, is working for you part-time or seasonal less than six, months, they leave and come back. If the absence is more than 13 or more weeks, that individual is treated as a new employee as opposed to an ongoing employee. There's also a rule of parity for uh, absences shorter than 13 or 26 weeks where an employer may choose to apply the rule of parity. And what this slide is trying to say is we, what we look at is if the period of time that they're absent is more than the period of time they work for you, then they're treated as a new employee. So I have an employee that worked for me for four months. They're, they've 
they leave for eight months, come back. What the IRS is telling me, that employee is treated as a new employee, not an ongoing employee. Also, there's a special rule for uh, anybody who is on family medical leave, jury duty, military leave. Under this proposal, and employers may choose to apply one or two methods. Either the, you exclude the uh, period of time that they're gone, or you credit hours for that period where they normally would work. You have one or two choices. So what you have to do, um, either in 2014 or 2015, you have to, if you employ any part-time or seasonal employees, you have to start measuring hours. It's an extremely important calculation. So if, if you're a company with 100 or more employees, you have to start worrying about this in 2014. If you're under 100 but more than 50, you have to worry about that in 2016. So if you're uh, 100 or more to do so, employers will need to begin tracking hours if you're a calendar year uh, plan as of October 15, 2013. So again, if you have been counting hours, please do so as soon as possible. So again, uh, you have to get those records together. For employers with large numbers of short-term employees, shorter look-back measurement periods may be optimal. I haven't run to a situation where it is advantageous because if you use shorter periods, what that means you have to remeasure several times during the year and that would be an administrative nightmare. As this slide indicates, 43, um, in most situations I've been advising clients on, a 12-month measuring period is optimal. It gives you maximum flexibility. Now, what they've indicated, and this, what this slide is trying to say, only for 2000, um, for stability periods beginning in 2015, what they said, is that yet generally the measurement period and the stability period has to be the same. They created a rule, a special rule for this year that said uh, as an employer you could use a six month measurement period and a 12 month stability period. And then the year after that use a 12 month measurement period. For us. So there's a special rule for 2015 where you can use a six month measurement period. So again, here's what you must do. Decide whether and how to adjust on the plan's bidding periods. Gather data to determine how the safe harbors will apply. Consider the safe harbor approaches. Uh, if determining safe harbors, determine the optimal measurement, administrative, and stability periods. Well, whatever you do, please remember, what you have to do is communicate this to your employees. Make sure they understand what the eligibility requirements. All right, now I've been advising a lot of restaurants, and when I tell people, is that look at your work staff. Are there, are there any individuals that are working for you that if they've left, it would be, it would be a, um, you would really feel it. What you may want to do is identify those better workers, make them full time, offer them coverage, and for everybody else, keep them part time. Because in that situation, you're not violating any rule, you do it on merit. You reward those people who are better workers, and you make sure you adhere to these rules without being extremely onerous. All right, let's turn next to uh, penalty taxes. Both taxes, um, healthcare reform, um, depends on offering eligible um, individuals eligible employer sponsored coverage to full time employees. All right, now. One thing that's very interesting about this calculation is uh, if you are an employer and you have four different companies with your employer, what that slide is trying to say to you is that whether you're going to be penalized is treated separately to each member of your company. So let's say you had a company with four different divisions, A, B, C, and D. Each one has 25 employees. So we, uh, we ca uh, calculate the number of employees. They're a large employer. In 2015, let's say we have to comply, two of the divisions decide to offer coverage, two don't decide to offer coverage. 
What that is trying to say is in determining the penalty, only those two divisions that don't offer coverage will be penalized, the other two will not be. That's what that slide is trying to say. So you could have situations where employers don't want to offer coverage. That's fine, but not the whole company is going to be penalized. Now, so large employers, if you don't offer minimum coverage, the penalty is $2,000 per employee minus the first 80. So again, if you have a company with 100 employees, don't offer coverage, the penalty is only $2,000 times 20, or $40,000. So this is a special exception they created for 2015, because now only companies over 100. But in my example, uh, in determining whether those companies are going to be penalized, that 80 employee reduction I just mentioned applies to the entire group. So if I have a company, for example, or half the companies offer coverage, half does not. They can only use half of that 40 employ, uh, 80 employee reduction. So in my example, uh, half the employer had 50 employees minus 40 would be 10. They'd be penalized $20,000 if they didn't offer coverage. So that 80 employee reduction you see there is applied on a control group basis. But again, if you decide not to offer coverage in 2015 or 2016, there's going to be a $2,000 penalty. Now, in 2016, that's going to be, again, reduced from 80 to 30. Because normally, that would be a 30 employee reduction. But for 2015, it's an 80 employee reduction. So again, as this slide indicates, it's done on a member-by-member uh, -member basis. Uh, each member who doesn't offer coverage will be penalized. That's what that is trying to say. Uh, and you have to offer coverage to dependent children. Now, again, um, the requirement is you have to offer coverage to the employees that's affordable, minimal, essential coverage. You also have to offer coverage to the dependent children. But you, as an employer, don't have to pay for it. Please remember. And you have no responsibility as an employer to offer any coverage to the spouse. No responsibility. So just the dependent children. Now, there's a requirement that if you do offer coverage, the coverage must be affordable, minimal, essential coverage. And the penalty is $3,000, but only if That person goes on the exchange and gets a credit and subsidy. Now, one point, I, one thing I forgot to mention about this prior penalty. Let me go back for a second. Uh, in order to avoid this penalty, you only have to offer coverage in 2015 to 70% of your employees. So, in order to avoid it. You identify those part-time employees and those full-time employees, and you determine how many full-time employees. Your responsibility in 2015 is you only have to offer coverage to 70%. Normally, there was a 95% uh, requirement. They've lowered it for 2015 to 70%. Now, if you're a large employer and you offered coverage to 70% of your employees, you would avoid this penalty right here. But if any of that other 30% go on the exchange and get a credit and subsidy, you'd be penalized the $3,000 penalty, which is the one right here. Now, in order to avoid the $3,000 penalty, you must offer employees affordable minimum coverage. What does that mean? Minimum coverage is it must cover 60% of the expenses under the plan. And affordable means that any premium cannot, uh, cannot exceed 9.5% of their wages. That's what that means. But only for single coverage. And I have a slide on that in the next few minutes. All right, let's go to slide 54. 
So avoid a $3,000 penalty, slide 54 indicates that you must pass these two tests. It must be minimum value, with most employer coverages are going to be minimum value, and it has to be 9.5% there. Now the slide indicates the fact it's 9.5% uh, of household income. The IRS has created three safe harbors. It could be 9.5% of W-2 wages, 9.5% of rate of pay, or 9.5% of federal poverty line. They're cited right there. So again, it's only 9.5% of single coverage that's based on current W-2 wages, current rate of pay. If you pay somebody 15 bucks an hour, it's 15 bucks an hour times 130 hours. That's the most anybody can pay. That's their portion of the premium. Now, does that mean the fact that each employee could pay a different premium? Absolutely. Does that, does that mean somebody making $20,000 is going to pay, pay, be paying half of what somebody is making $40,000? Absolutely. So you can vary your contributions about how much an employee makes. And that's what they're saying there. You can do that if you want to. Or you can say to the employees, we're going to take the lowest paid person, determine what 9.5% of that, and everybody pays the same amount. You can do that too. But if you want to vary your contribution depending on what their salary is, this gives you the right to do so. But it's based on current income. All right? And again, it's minimum value. Most employer coverages will have no problem with this. It's minimum coverage in order to, so most, co most employer coverages are in the range of 70 to 80 to 90% of benefits. Uh, which you may want to consider for 2015 is to offer a cheaper plan to employees and base your contributions off of that. You may want to do that. Now, one of the biggest questions I get from employers is, well, um, I have union employees. Am I off the hook? And the answer is no. You have to make sure, as an employer, that union plan, that multi-employer plan, is affordable, minimal, essential coverage. Because if it's not, it's not the union that's going to be penalized. It's you. Union employees are accounted for the large employer calculation. And they're counted, and again, you could be penalized if the union plan isn't up to speed. So please remember that. There's no buy just because your employees who are in a union or in a union plan. The coverage must be affordable and must be minimum 60%. So you have to check and get a statement from the union to make sure uh, that you're not going to be penalized. So each participating employer is responsible for identifying its full-time employees and then making sure you pay any penalties if that coverage isn't up to speed. So again, it's up to you to decide and find out whether that coverage is affordable. Now, what's going to happen in 2015 before any penalty tax is triggered, you're going to be notified uh, if any employee goes on the exchange and get a credit and subsidy. And before you're penalized, what's going to happen is they're going to ask you, did you offer those individuals coverage? So your employees could be eligible because the employer does not provide minimum essential coverage. Or the coverage is not affordable for that particular employee. But again, the employer must also receive notification of the appeals process before they're penalized by the IRS. So they're going to ask you. You're going to get a friendly letter from the IRS saying, did you offer coverage? And you have to respond to that. So when they, the exchange determines the applicant is eligible to receive advanced payments of premium credits or subsidies, they will send a notice to you that that person received a credit or subsidy. All right. And the notice will include the employee's identity, that the employee has been determined to be eligible for advanced payments of credit and subsidies, 
and that the employer may be liable for a shared responsibility payment. And then you, if you're decided to be penalized, the IRS, IRS for that will send you a bill. So the IRS will contact the employers to inform them of their potential liability and provide them an opportunity to respond before any liability is assessed and demand for payment is made. The contact for any given year will not occur until after the employer's uh, individual tax returns are filed and they get the credit. So for 2015, it won't be until sometime in 2000, later in 2016 before you get any penalty notices. So if it's determined that the employer is liable for any penalties, the employer has to respond to the initial IRS contact, and the IRS will send a notice and demand payment. And that notice will instruct the employer how to make the payment. Um, and the employer will not be required to include the payment in any tax return. You'll get a separate bill. So you say to yourself, how are they going to know all this stuff? Well, guess why? You're going to have to report coverage to the IRS. So report, any large employer will have to report their coverage to the IRS. Uh, this will be uh, first applicable in 2015. The first returns are going to be filed by March of 2016. And you have to give your employees a summary of that filing by January of 2016. So the reporting statement requirements apply for 2015. Their first information returns will be filed in early 2016. And the IRS will use this information that the employers report to verify any employer calculations. It applies to any applicable large employer. Now, this is important. This reporting requirement applies to any employer 50 or more. So even if you're not subject to the penalty, you still have to report in 2015. So what are they going to ask for? The employer's name, date, I, uh, EIN number, certification, whether the employer offers employees and their, and their dependents the opportunity to enroll in coverage, the number of full-time employees, and the name, address, and tax ID number of each full-time employee, and any other information required by the IRS. And so far, they have not required any more than this. Now, the forms they're going to require is they're going to require a Form 10 94C. Uh, this form has not been released yet. So stay tuned for that. And annual, re annual returns must be filed with the IRS by February 28th, March 31st, if it's filed electronically. And it is going to be on the same filing schedule as forms W-2 and 1099. Then you have to give a written statement to your employees and that is uh, reported on Form 1095C. So each employee, this is another uh, notice that they, they won't read. But you have to provide for them. Questions? As you can see, this is extremely complicated convoluted, frustrating, my life. Uh, you're not alone. Everybody's frustrated because they keep unchanging the rules. So please reach out to us. I can help you. I do probably two or three meetings a week with clients talking about this. I met, like I said, I met a race, with a racetrack, and they had five different categories of employees we had to go through. So it's something. This is my contact information. Uh, I have a newsletter that comes out six to eight times a month. So uh, instead of bothering uh, Bill, if you want a copy of that um, explanation, it's on my website. And it's never any bother. Do you have a question? Yes, I do. When we offer employees insurance, and they either accept it themselves or they waive it, what obligation do we as employers have to make sure that that's offered to their dependents? 
Well, in your, in your waiver, what you have to do is that by indicating to them in the waiver that you are waiving that coverage for yourself and your dependents. But they could take individual insurance and still have dependents. But, but, right, but again, what you must do in your, in your um, application for coverage saying, I'm offering you and your employees, and then in the waiver, if they pick only individual coverage, you must have a separate waiver for those dependents saying, yes, uh, you offered me uh, coverage for myself and my children, but I'm, I'm only taking individual coverage. I'm waiving coverage for my children. So it's very clear that you offered coverage to both, but only the only pick single coverage. But if the employee is waiving coverage for an adult child, is the employee's waiver acceptable, or do we have to get the waiver from the adult? There's child? no indication there has to be a separate waiver for the adult child. I have not seen that requirement. Okay. Thank you. Any other any other questions? Correct. The only the only difference on that is Cobra. Cobra. Every individual child has is a qualified beneficiary, so they have an individual right. Here they don't, because if the if the employee doesn't take coverage, then the child doesn't get it. Thank you very much. Hopefully, I didn't confuse you too much. <laughs>